Hi and welcome. My name is Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Gerringong Anglican Church. And I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service for this Good Friday. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you with us as we come together to celebrate uh, the death of our Saviour. If you have a green Australian prayer book, you might like to turn to page 45. If you're following the service, what will you find that starts on that page? This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 95 reads, O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, put me to proof that they had seen my works, of whom I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. That psalm encourages us to sing out to the Lord, to sing praise to the Lord who created and sustains all. Will you join with me as we sing our first hymn, uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross?
Well, as we ponder the words of that song, uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, we ponder why did Jesus die? Why did God send him? He sent it because of our sin. Um, in the psalm we read earlier from Psalm 95, it encouraged us to, to not harden our hearts as Israel did in the wilderness, um, to put our, keep our trust in God. But we don't always do that, do we? So I wonder if you would join with me as we each say together the prayer of confession that you'll find on page 44 of the prayer books. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Have mercy on us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you and live a new life to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we, we come and we confess our, to him, our sins to him, knowing that because of what Christ has done, our sin is washed away. As we... Prepare to, to hear more about God's, from God. Uh, let me pray uh, before we hear, have the Bible read for us. Lord God, whose blessed Son rose in triumph and set us free, grant us the fullness of spiritual gifts he promised us, that through the Holy Spirit our hearts may possess him whom our eyes cannot see, the same Jesus our Lord. And we thank you for your holy word and for the fellowship of the church. May your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory and to the salvation of our fellow, people, fellow mankind. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The first reading today comes from the Old Testament, from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, starting at verse 8 and going through to verse 16. This is the prophet Nathan speaking to King David. Now then. Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut, you off, cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men and with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading today is from John's Gospel, chapter 18, reading from 28 to 40. It's headed, Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the place of the Roman palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. 
Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? I am a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews, Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But... It is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release this king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Here ends the reading. Well, before John comes to speak to us from those passages, uh, will you join with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed, remembering that even though we may be sitting at home and watching this on our own, that we join with Christians throughout the ages and throughout the world in, ha in have faith in Jesus. So together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Over to you, John. Well, hello, and welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, my name is John Clare, and uh, I'm one of the ministers here at Gerringong Anglican Church. Uh, and it is uh, a great to be sharing this Easter time with you. Now, at the moment, there's a lot of interest uh, in a particular courtroom, a particular case, all the way on the other side of the world in New York. But I'm not going to be talking about that. I want us instead, on this Good Friday, at the beginning of an Easter weekend, to focus on another courtroom scene, one that happened 2,000 years ago on a different side of the world, the one we've read about in John chapter 18. Uh, we're looking at John's Gospel because we've just finished a series working our way through some earlier chapters of John's Gospel. Uh, and in that series, we were looking at the, the really good, really tricky, uh, but fair questions that people were asking about Jesus, or the questions uh, that Jesus was asking them. Fair questions about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And so because we've been asking lots of questions and looking at John's Gospel, here on Good Friday, I've been asked to talk about the events of John's Gospel uh, of, of Good Friday with a very particular question. What is truth? Now, that sounds very kind of, you know, abstract and heavy for the start of a holiday long weekend, but there's a reason for it. It is, of course, the question that Pontius Pilate asks when he is interrogating Jesus. And Jesus has been talking about being the one who has come to bring truth, the one who's come in truth. Uh, now, if you find this question just a bit strange, what is truth? Uh, you know, sometimes questions get asked that are a bit awkward. Uh, it reminded me of uh, that time quite a few years ago 
when the when the then Prince Charles and his fiancée Lady Diana uh, were asked whether they were in love. And uh, Lady Di, of course, straight away said, of course. And Prince Charles said, whatever love means. It was very awkward. Uh, and the question that uh, Prince Charles asked uh, kind of came across uh, very profound and reflective and philosophical, but at the same time, kind of cynical and, and jaded and dismissive, or maybe even just ignorant about what love actually was and what was involved. Uh, and I find that that's a little bit the same with this question that Pontius Pilate asks, what is truth? Either he really has no idea, or maybe he is being all profound and abstract and philosophical. After all, he was a highly educated Roman official, uh, and we know that in Greek and Roman philosophy, uh, debating about the nature of truth was something that they loved to do. Uh, it could be that that's the angle he's approaching it from, but it would also seem that he is being cynical. He's being a bit dismissive of what Jesus is saying, uh, in the same way that he's pretty dismissive of the Jewish religious leadership. Uh, it's actually in, in keeping with what we know of Pontius Pilate from some sources outside the Bible. He really didn't like the Jewish people and he didn't like or respect the Jewish religious leadership. And so it could be that uh, in having this, these conversations with Jesus, uh, he's quite happy to release Jesus and find nothing wrong with him, find him innocent, because he knows it'll really, really aggravate the Jewish religious leadership. And in the same way, he can be completely dismissive of, you know, all of this, all these things that Jesus is saying, because he really doesn't care. Uh, but regardless of his original motives or meaning in that question, it's actually a really good question for us to ask as we are here on this Good Friday, as we think about the events of Good Friday. You see, we live in a world that is now described as a post-truth society. The truth doesn't actually matter. It isn't a thing. You don't, you, there's no objective facts. Uh, we see this in, in public debate. We see this in politics, uh, whatever country you're in, where things that used to be regarded as non-negotiable are now up for grabs. Uh, and so because of that, us actually asking what is truth, when we talk about the events of that first Easter, and in particular Jesus' death on the cross, uh, it's a really good thing for us to do. So, how do we answer this question, what is truth? Well, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I reckon what we need to do is break it down into three questions. What is truth, we break down into what actually happened, what does it mean, and do you believe it? That's how we kind of approach the events of Good Friday. What actually happened, what does it mean, and do you believe it? So let's look at the first one. What actually happened? Well, there's been this growing opposition to the ministry of Jesus, to the claims of Jesus, to be the Son of God and the King that God has promised. Uh, and his popularity amongst the people uh, is making the religious leaders very worried. And so they've been plotting to get rid of him. And it's all come to a head and they've gone to the Garden of Gethsemane in the middle of the night and had him arrested and dragged off to the high priest's house where they've been interrogating him. And in the end, they're so furious, they're incensed by his answers and his claims to be the Son of God that they decide that he must die. But there's a catch. They, of course, are not allowed to execute people under Roman occupation, and so they have to take him off to Pontius Pilate. And that's the scene we're looking at today, this trial before Pilate. Uh, now, when they bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate, they claim that uh, he needs to die because he is wanting to lead a rebellion against the Romans. Jesus is claiming to be the promised king, 
but they're emphasizing the fact that he's claiming to be the king of the Jews. So not the emperor, the Roman emperor in charge, but this king of the Jews. There have been rebellions here and there. The Romans are very on edge about it all. The Jewish leadership are very on edge because they don't want you know, a harsh Roman crackdown. So this is a perfect question for them, a perfect charge for them to make against Jesus. One that they'll think Pilate will just jump on and get rid of Jesus, no questions asked. But that's not the way Pilate operates. And so Pilate actually finds Jesus innocent. In talking to this man, he finds out very quickly that he's not claiming to be a political king, to lead an army in revolution against the Romans. He's, he's just not into that. And Pilate can't see that this man, this humble and kind of inoffensive or, or harmless seeming, he certainly was offensive to some people, uh, this harmless seeming man could be the leader of a, of a rebellion. He, he finds there's, there's just nothing you know, to these charges. So he's happy for him to be released. And he tells the Jewish leaders this, and they are very unhappy. And Pilate realises very quickly that he still has to placate them. He's got to, he's got to deal with this Jesus bloke somehow. Uh, and this time when they come back to him, they claim that Jesus must die because he's broken their religious laws. And in particular, he's, he's blasphemous. He's claiming to be God himself. And the only reason they're coming to Pilate, of course, is they're not allowed to execute. And so Pilate now has this dilemma. He, he's not interested in Jewish religious law. He's not qualified to make judgments in it. Suddenly he's being called to you know, make a decision about this man for reasons that he's just not at all interested in. And again, he can't find anything wrong with him. He doesn't really care. Uh, he always wants him released. He has Jesus flogged so that he can say to the Jewish leaders, oh, I've punished him, but here he is, and look how pathetic he is. You can't really want me to execute him. You can't really expect him to be regarded as a threat. And he thinks this is what's going to end the situation. But then we find this substitution. When Pilate offers to release Jesus, as a, as a mark of mercy, the tradition on that festival, that Passover festival day, they demand instead Barabbas. And this is a shock, because Barabbas is what they had been claiming Jesus was. Barabbas is a terrorist. He is a revolutionary. He has been involved in violent uprisings against the Romans. He's exactly what they claimed Jesus was, and they're saying that's who they want freed rather than Jesus. It's a substitution of the innocent Jesus for the criminal Barabbas. And that's the sort of substitution that Good Friday is all about. And so John's Gospel uh, continues in chapter 19 to, de to detail the crucifixion and death of Jesus. And so the story of Good Friday ends with Jesus dead and buried. That's what actually happened. And one thing that it's really important to remember is that this is true. It did actually happen. We actually know from the gospel accounts, we have these four gospel accounts, these biographies of Jesus, that are real historical documents. And so we know that this happened because those documents says that it did. But also, we have information in other sources, not in the Bible, uh, Jewish and Roman historians like Josephus and Tacitus who tell of the fact that Jesus died on a cross. So these events actually happened. They are true in the first of our three categories. Jesus died on the cross at the orders of Pontius Pilate. But what does it mean? And when we talk about what it means, we're thinking about the context and the significance of these events. Uh, and on the surface, it's about you know, the immediate situation. Jesus has annoyed the religious elite, and so they've got rid of him. He, he's fallen victim to their plots. But of course, there's a lot more going on here. You see, there have been many, many places in the Scriptures, in the Old Testament up until this point, that have contained clues and spoilers and promises 
about the way God was going to rescue his people. And those clues, those spoilers, those promises have been pointing towards the events of this first Easter weekend. They've been pointing to Jesus. Uh, and it's all of these that provide the context to these events, to what happened on that first Good Friday. When you realise that Jesus was the Son of God, was the promised King, was intended to die for his people on the cross so that their sins could be forgiven. When you understand that that's what's been promised in the Old Testament and again by Jesus predicting that this is exactly what was going to happen to him. You see that God is actually at work in all of this. This isn't just some random, unfortunate incident that Jesus was getting on with one thing and then, you know, false arrest and false charges and unfortunate execution. No, this was all part of God's plan. All part of God's plan to act in history to save his people. And that's why in our second Bible reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, you saw some promises made to one of Jesus' ancestors, King David. Promises that uh, one of his descendants would rule forever. Uh, but there'd be some aspect of suffering. Uh, we've got this idea of God's promised king and suffering and ruling forever, all coming from these promises made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But then if you go further back, this is, of course, the Passover weekend, and that's all about the way God saved his people through the use of a sacrifice. A lamb without blemish was sacrificed to take the place of the firstborn of Israel. A lamb without blemish was sacrificed to save from death. And so we see these echoes of the innocent Jesus being offered up as a sacrifice on the Passover weekend. So all of this context has kind of been leading to these events. But for us to really understand what's happening, uh, John's Gospel right at the beginning has a really helpful summary. And I think you've probably heard this one before. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, that's what the meaning of these events on Good Friday is. Jesus giving his life so the people might be saved from death, might be forgiven. Uh, and we see this also in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, these two summaries of what Good Friday was all about highlight an uncomfortable truth. And that truth is the further context, not just to Good Friday, but to all of human existence. And that's the problem of sin. Now, sin isn't just a list of rules of do's and don'ts. Sin is an attitude of the heart. It's an attitude, a way of relating to God that says, I'm not going to obey you, God. I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to deliberately disobey you. Whatever, you know, whatever kind of option or combination of, of, of things there. It's, an, it's, it's the way of living your life, not only as though God is not there, but that you're deliberately claiming you are not God. I am God. I am in charge. You're not the boss of me, as the kids often say. Uh, the more uncomfortable truth about sin is that we all do it. And that means we all face the consequence, the penalty, and that penalty is death. And so we put all of this together, we find that the true meaning of the events of that first Good Friday are that Jesus, the Son of God, the King promised by God, chose to die on a cross even though he was innocent. And he did this so we might be saved. He chose to take the penalty for us so that we could be forgiven. And of course, at the risk of telling you a spoiler about uh, what's happening on Sunday, Jesus actually came back from the dead to show that death had been defeated as well as sin. So that as well as forgiveness, we also have the promise of eternal life, life forever in perfect friendship with God. Uh, that's why Easter is such a wonderful weekend to celebrate. But let's keep going. We've had our first two questions, third and last. 
Do you believe it? That's our category in working out what is truth. What actually happened? What does it mean? And do you believe it? You see, the Jewish religious leaders didn't believe Jesus' claims about being the son of God or the promised king. Pilate doesn't believe their claim, claims that Jesus is a troublemaker or a rebel, uh, the king of the Jews, that he's dangerous in any way. And many people don't believe that Jesus uh, who is who the Bible says he is and did what the Bible said he did. Many people don't believe that sin is real or that God's punishment of sin is real. But because these things are true, it demands a response from us. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? If so, do you believe that he died on the cross so that you could be forgiven your sins, to take the penalty that you deserved? Do you actually believe that? Because if you do, that has to shape the way you live your life. That shapes who you are. Uh, so since these things are true, we have to respond. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised King, the Saviour, the Lamb without blemish who died on the cross for your sins? Well, if so, in the light of John 3.16, it means you are saved. And I know that many people watching this now have put their faith in Jesus. But I'd just like to challenge those who haven't yet to weigh up all these facts, to look at the truth about Easter, about Jesus, and to believe. Once you understand the context, understand the meaning, understand the significance of what happened on that first Easter weekend, then what Jesus was saying in John chapter 18 about truth becomes all the more powerful. He is the true meaning of Easter. He is the one true God come to save us. And following him is the one and only true way to be saved. If you want forgiveness from all the things you've done, all the burdens, all the guilt, if you want to know that you will live forever in perfect relationship with God, then why not this weekend, this Easter weekend, put your faith in Jesus. Trust in the truth of the one who died and came back to life to save you. Well, in response to what we've heard from God's word, will you join with me in prayer? You turn to page 48 of your prayer books. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Collect for Good Friday. Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, wrought our redemption by shedding his blood for us. Watch over us always and keep us in your love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we continue in prayer, uh, let us pray uh, for the spread of the gospel around the world. We praise you, Lord of all, for the gifts of Christ, our ascended King, for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Hear our prayer for all who do not know your love and have not heard the gospel of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Send out your light and your truth through the messengers of your word. Help us to support them by our prayers and offerings and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We remember the, um, the many missionaries who take the gospel out uh, and this Easter time will be proclaiming the good news of Jesus around the world. We pray for the cows in Italy. 
Uh, we pray for the Damons in their new ministry in Cobar. We pray for the Tumani Ministries as they plant churches and, uh, and, grow, and grow them in Kenya. We pray for Zambia's Child and the uh, Ipalo Christian School, that they might be places uh, where your word is proclaimed truly and faithfully. We can continue to pray for the Garlets down in, uh, in Shack, uh, that they might reach into the Aboriginal community uh, with the, the saving news of Jesus. And Father, we pray that you might raise, continue to raise up more and more people. We pray for Andrew and Beck who have gone to uh, the Middle East. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, protect them and work through them through their football ministry, that they might uh, have opportunities to share your word. And Lord, please continue to raise up more people, including ourselves, as we're thinking about reaching out to our own area with the good news, like Peter. Almighty God, look with compassion on the world you have redeemed by the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Move the hearts of many to offer themselves for the sacred ministry of your church, so that by their lives and labours, your light may shine in the darkness and the coming of your kingdom be advanced. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for this beautiful world that you have made, but we recognise that there is so much pain and suffering in it. And so we look across the world and we weep, as you must do. Uh, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We ask that that senseless war might come to an end. But we pray for conflict in all places of the world. We pray for the country of Yemen. We pray for Myanmar, uh, for South Sudan, for Eritrea, uh, for Afghanistan and for so many other places where there is pain and suffering. God of the nations, whose kingdom rules over all, have mercy on our broken and divided world. Shed abroad your peace in the hearts of all people and banish from them the spirit that makes for war, that all races and people may learn to live as members of one family and in obedience to your laws through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And finally, we pray for those known to us uh, who are suffering anyway. Maybe there be people known to you uh, that you would like to bring before the Lord now. People who are uh, sick, people who are grieving, people who are lonely, people who are depressed or anxious. Um, we pray we bring them before the Lord now. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or any other trouble give them a firm trust in your goodness help those who minister to them and bring us all into the joy of your salvation father hear our prayer through jesus christ our lord amen and back on page 49 the lord be with you let us praise the lord thanks be to god and the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Let's finish off our service by singing a wonderful hymn uh, of praise to God. In the cross of Christ I glory. Let's, let's sing together. Thank you.